for a 10 day PR. Our, our people in our office were going crazy because they kept having to churn out amendments. I would, and then I will tell you, since 96, any agency that runs a severable service contract, unless they have to, from October 1 to September 30th, it's crazy. Right. We should, it should be moved off the fiscal the year. year. Okay. Um, go ahead, yes. But sometimes you can't avoid it. Say that again, I'm sorry. This is severable service, so we're going to talk more about because severable services are different than non-severable services are different than supplies. But the exception to which you were referring to the, the one-year exception the is for severable mm -hmm. services under FASA. The one-year exception. The multi-year contract does not specify ser severable or non-severable. And this you will understand when I talk about the bona fide needs rule for non-severable services, because non-severable services whether they take two, five years to complete, have to be obligated all in the first year in which the obligation started, in which the contract began. That's why our contracts say we can cut them off on 30 days notice at any time. Well, That's and you, several, right? running a program, you get a benefit every time that program. Let's, let's, go, let's go back and start. Let's start talking about the, the different ones. Let's start with supplies, and then we'll go through the difference with severable and non-severable services. Um, because the bona fide needs rule required that you have something for several services because you, the way that that rule worked. But let's look at supplies. Okay, so the, what's the next one? Oh, they went that, sorry. Uh, we'll skip that for now. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, here's the general rule. The obligation entry into meets a need of the fiscal year that is current at the time and not a need of the, a future year. Let me, wait a minute, let me go back one more time. I'm sorry about this. Let me make a point of the time statute. What the time statute actually goes to is payment of expenses. If the obligation is not properly incurred during the time availability of the appropriation, we can't pay the bill. And if we pay the bill, our certifying officers are on the hook. Okay, so this kind of sets up the bona fide needs rule, but it only allows the payment of expenses from properly incurred obligations. And that's where the bona fide needs rule comes into play. So a lot of times you'll hear me say, we're looking back because you have a bill and you can't play a contractor. You'll hear me or somebody from the payments office saying, I can't pay that bill because it violates 31 U.S.C. 1502. The certifying officer is personally liable for illegal payments. So there are two windows of vulnerability in terms of committing an Anti-Deficiency Act violation. One is at the time of obligation. The other is at the time of expenditure, when the bills are paid. Yeah. This and this will go more to the responsibility of, the, of our certifying officers as well. Because we might actually have the money to pay the bill. It may not bust the allotment of the pro and it might not end up being an Anti-Deficiency Act violation. But if they violate this and it wasn't properly incurred, they could actually end up being in a lot of trouble. It's an illegal payment. The, the TV station continues to run the program after the expiration of the contract and then expects to get paid for it. That's correct. And if, and in that case, can we, and they bring the bill in and we don't have a contract, right. we can't pay it. Right. So we would have to do a couple of different things. And then we're going to talk about that a little bit later. It might be rate, rate for ratification. There may be, depending on the facts and circumstances, mm -hmm. depending on what happens. Um, we may not want to do anything. We may not want to pay that bill. Um, we may have left the impression that it was going to be to pay, pay that bill, so there might be something well, under well, we quantum merit theory. In the contract, specific language that says we will not. Right. Pay. Right. And and this happens a lot in our agency. A lot of times, even here in the United States, because no one's monitoring the tra contract, and they didn't realize the contract had run out, right. and the person kept working. Suddenly, bills come in. There's no properly incurred obligation. How are we going to certify that payment? And so until some action gets taken by this agency, there's not going to be any payment, payment, 
But the point I wanted to make here is the reason why you'll hear this is we don't have any certifying officers in the room. I don't know if Mella Jo is still here. She is. So Mella Jo is the director of financial operations. She is the overseer of all certifying officials in this agency. Certifying officers are the only federal officials that are personally liable for their mistakes. So if one of Mel and Joe's certifying officers certifies a payment from an obligation that's not properly incurred, and that payment we can't get back, it may come out of her people's pockets. A lot of times you'll see, you know, usually, hopefully if everything goes through, you'll go through payments smoothly. But if not, they might be taking a second look. And they should be, because if there's something wrong on its face, they need to raise the issue so that there's no illegal payment made. Yes. Stand up, Melajo, so we can hear you. That's okay. No, and it's a good point, too. A lot of times this will happen at the f fiscal year, end of the fiscal year, will cross over. And it makes it a lot more difficult because, you know, it takes working with the contracting officer as well. For example, in the, you know, if there's no um, contract in place, but a COTAR told the contractor to keep working, we may have a ratification um, situation where Gary's office is going to get it. And if it comes over $10,000, I'm going to get it as well. Gary cannot ratify it if everything was from last year, that the, the command was given the year prior, and there's no money to do it. Because if he ratifies it, and there's no money to cover that obligation, you're going to end up with an Anti-Deficiency Act violation. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But the problem I think that Melajo is highlighting is this becomes a problem for the payments office, but it's really not their problem to fix. It's their problem to stop and then they end up being the bad guys because everybody in the agency will yell that their bills aren't getting paid, not understanding the system of why they can't get paid. Um, so, you know, it's, they try to be as informative, but it happens a lot, and then it all gets thrown down in that office, and the payments people are really getting the brunt of it when really the problem happens at the obligation stage or in the execution of the contract. Um, and I know a lot of the, the AOs in the room get in the middle of it as well, too. So it's really, really important for the AOs and the payments office and the contracting officer to work together, talk to the COTARs, the people who are giving the um, assignments out, and make sure they understand what went wrong so it does not happen again. Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay, so when we're talking about properly incurred, usually we're talking about the bona fide needs rule and the exceptions. So let's talk about the bona fide needs rule first. The obligation entered into meets the need of the fiscal year that is current at the time and not a need of the future year. This year's money so any, for this year's right. needs. I can't use, oh, Doug knows he's going to need some promotional activity in 2013. He has a little extra money in 2012. 
he's going to make an order now. Well, really? Should he be doing that? No. That would be a future need in 2013. You can't use 12 money for 13. Okay. Um, what about if Gary had a new contracting officer coming in to work in the Office of Contracts? And he needed to put a new workstation together for this person. Um, and the person was starting on September 15th. Gary ran out of an allotment and could not put in a new workstation. He had to share a workstation with another contracting officer. On October 15th, when he gets his new allotment for the next fiscal year, can he now use that money to buy a workstation? Sure. The need continues into the next fiscal year. Okay. Very what simple. About a trade show? Mm -hmm. In January, uh -huh. reservations for your booth space closed on September 15th. Very good question. If you have to make the reservation in the obligation prior to the end of the fiscal year so you can go to that trade show, it is a need of the prior year. Okay? But that's, a, you know, it's a question of do you need to do it? It's the same thing with training. If your training class is going to fill up that you need to take in November and you wait till October 1, <laughs> then you register and obligate prior year fiscal money. Um, what if, did I just what if, thing? what if it didn't close on September 15th, but you got the early bird discount on September 15th? No. There is actually case law against that. Okay. Taking an advantage of a discount is not enough to make it a bona fide need of the prior year. It makes no I, I will tell you, it's unfortunate. I actually work for, um, I'm at work, I'm a general counsel for the AABPA, which is a nonprofit organization uh, for budget analysts, budget and program analysts here in Washington, D.C. And every year they have a fall symposium. And every year <laughs> they say if you register by September 30th, you will get a discount thinking that agencies need to use their prior money. And it actually came to my desk before I was a, a, the general counsel. I was, a lot of people at GAO are involved in this, obviously, because it's budget analysts, program analysts. And um, our director was on the board of directors, one of our directors, the board of directors there. And she basically sent it around telling everybody, I got to use my 2009 money registered now to get the early bird discount. We had to tell her. No, you can't use U9 money for that. So they actually have changed the registration rules at APPA so that they have to <laughs> register by September 30th. Yeah. Um, again, you just get the facts and the information. Does that mean they can't do, you know, come back and say, well, they said we might be able to do late registration. The rule of thumb is if your people need to go to that training and they are going to be locked out because they wait to October 1st, we can justify that as a bona fide year, need of the prior year, not just to get a discount, though. Um, this year's need. So that goes through all of that. Let's look at all these different rules. We'll probably only get through the supplies, maybe not in and the difference between non and severable, severable and non-severable services. So apply, supplies, there are a couple of rules with that. The general rule is the supply used, for, uh, acquired for use during the current year are bona fide needs of that year. That's simple, right? But what about if the supply has to be manufactured? I need a computer station and it's going to take three months for them to manufacture it and deliver it to me, right? I'm not going to use it to 2012, maybe not till December, but I got to order it in September. Same rule of what Doug is saying. If there is a lead time or a manufacture time, um, you're okay. There is case law that talks about supplies delivered in the subsequent fiscal year our, our bona fide needs of the current year, if the time between the delivery and the contracting is not excessive, what does that mean? What is not excessive? 
And it can't be a commercial item. Commercial items where you get off the shelf, take them away. So those are gone. You, it takes like less than a day or whatever to get there, forget it. That is going to depend on the fact and facts and circumstances of what not excessive is. So if you wanted to order something on September 25th, but it's not going to be delivered until October 15th, and it's not a commercial item, is two weeks not excess excessive? Depends on the item. Okay. Sorry, I didn't put bullets in here. You can't really see them. They're on the side. The last rule is the inventory rule with supplies. An agency is allowed to keep an inventory of supplies. So just because I'm ordering a lot of inventory at the end of the year, which most agencies do replenish inventory at the end of the year, and I'm technically not going to use that pen until next fiscal year, does not mean it's not in need of this year. You can keep an inventory, a healthy inventory of supplies at the end of the fiscal year. Most agencies will order a lot of inventory at the end of the fiscal year. Now, where file. you can w run afoul of this is if you suddenly have a lot of money and you decide to order 10 years worth of paper or suddenly have a increase of spending that's not normal from prior years it, without a good justification. Then you can get yourself into trouble with that. But certainly, if you have money at the end of the year, you should be looking at your inventory. Is there something that you can put into inventory that you'll need throughout the next year? Most agencies will do that. OK. So the supply rules are pretty easy. Need of the year in which you order and use it. If there's some manufacturer lead time beforehand that you need three months to get that to you delivered in the next fiscal year, it's need of the prior year and the inventory rule. Now let's talk about something a little bit more difficult, which is severable versus non-severable services. And after we talk about this, I'm going to let you guys go, and we'll pick it up again on Wednesday morning. Um, when you're looking at services, to determine what need, what year it's a bona fide need of, you have to determine first whether it's severable or non-severable. Sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes we can manipulate it. Sometimes we can't. But the rule of thumb basically um, is if the agency incurs a benefit as the, uh, the service is being provided. So we had a rule up here. Useful results obtainable throughout the period of the contract performance. As the contract is performed, agency receives a benefit. Just to give me an example, I'll give you an example. I have somebody come and wash the windows once a month here. Every time they come and they wash the windows, I incur the benefit. The contract may be for a whole year, but do I wait to the end of the year to incur the benefit? No. As they perform, they incur the benefit. <coughs> editorial services for our agency. Um, we contract out for a lot of editorial services. We probably contract out for three year months to a year at a time for these services. Do we wait to the end of the period of the contract with all their assignments so we get the benefit? No. We get the benefit as they provide the editorial services throughout the time period that they're here. Um, severable services follow the same rule as supplies. So when you incur the benefit, meaning when the service is delivered, each time the window washer comes and washes my windows, it's at that one time he washes my windows with a bona fide need of that fiscal year when he does it. That's generally the rule. We have exceptions, and we've already mentioned them under FAFSA, and we'll go through them on Wednesday morning. So we generally, if there's a lead time, this came up actually this year. Um, the question of we needed, I think it was direct TV services and OCB maybe? down in Miami, yeah. and they were going to start, the service actually was going to start on October 1, but they really needed to be, they needed to come in and put in the box and do these other things prior to getting the service. Now technically the contract probably should have started in September, even though the service was going to start in October 1, but that would be the same case as a supply. You needed to do something to get that service acted by October 1. So it was a need of 2011 in that case. 
we'd be looking at it in the same way. Training is considered a severable service. Training is generally considered a bona fide need in the year in which the training takes place, unless, as Doug pointed out, I need, or it's a trade show, it's similar, I need to register, otherwise I'm not going to get into that training. Now, non-severable service. Sure. Yes. During the training, um, both of the events be canceled or postponed. If they cancel? Yeah. Do you feel? If they cancel the training. If they cancel the training. The training provider canceled the training, or you canceled the no, training? The training provider. If the training provider canceled the training, we may be able to use the replacement contract rules to get back the money. We do that. We may, we may be able to do that. We're, if about, the, we're about to do that in Nigeria. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have to... Um, but what if you want to pay me? Not in Kufa. Not in Kufa. Not, not in Kufa. There's a case of stream training. Okay, that's um, we probably can use... If it hasn't been paid. You if it has been paid. You, I mean, you obligated the money mm -hmm. because you need to go to the training If the I say you were uh, supposed to go to training in November, uh, you paid it out of 2011 money. You're obligated to pay it out. Out of 2011 right. money. Right. So the, and then the training provider cancels the training. Mm -hmm. and what I'm saying is you may be able to use the replacement contract rules to get back to that 2011 money. Well, there's there but is you a have to look at it. You can take another training using that money. You may be able to. It depends, and that and that's. That's what I'm trying to say. If you, it, if it's training that you have to have, and it can't, so something happens, and the training wants the training provider needs to move it to the next month, mm -hmm. or if you have, or the training provider goes away, and you need to go to another training provider to provide that exact same training, you may be able to use the replacement contract rules to do that, but you really need to get an opinion from CFO and from our office before you do it. Now, if you cancel the training, no, that money's gone. Okay. Now, if the, usually when a training provider cancels the training, they'll move you to another training date, and so the obligation will just continue. But in the case where the training provider is not going to provide the training, and you need to go out, it's got to be the same training. So I can't go be trained. I can't take a sign up for fiscal law, and then say, oh well, we'll give you procurement law. No, no, that doesn't work. It's got to be the same training. By the way, there's there's a myth out there in the training community that I can, as long as I have a need for the training now, I can go ahead and buy the training course now. And even if the training in, in September, and even if the training isn't going to be offered till next May, I can use my current money for, to go to a training course in May. That's based on an OPM letter that was issued shortly after a GAO decision came out. And the GAO decision basically blessed that scenario in which the agency had absolutely no control over when the training course was going to be offered, and the training course was actually offered in October. And under those circumstances, GAO said, fine, it was outside the control of the agency. The period of time into the next fiscal year wasn't, wasn't extreme. Somehow or other, it's gotten out into the training community that they, that there's blanket authority to at any time send somebody to a training course six months, seven months, eight months into the next fiscal year based on current year money. That's simply not true. So if you're going to go past, say, November, please consult with the legal office before you commit to that. I would say, too, even if you're going to go past November, because the GAO case actually came down, it was the first week of October, too. Yes. It was not late October. And there is a rule, and people think the rule is the first quarter of the year. The real test is, do I have to register in the prior fiscal year to get that training? So again, there could be times where it could be happening in May because the training is abroad. or right. And so you still have to register in September. So the test really is, when do I have to register in order for me to get this training? But the GAO case came down in, in, on October 7th. And one thing that I've heard, somebody said that rule to me here, oh, well, it's in the first quarter of the fiscal year. 
That is not the rule. The rule is when do I have to register for me to get the training? Now, because we do a lot of international training, it could be now the further you go away, certainly the first week of the fiscal year, nobody's going to question you. Second week, possibly. But the further you go away, you better have a good justification of why you need to travel and it, or train. And it may just be that, you know, early registration because of the nature of the conference. So, okay. Um, okay, non service letter. It does not receive a benefit until all the services are rendered, cannot sever the service in two parts. Okay. So the examples we have generally are research projects. If you are getting, doing audience research, and you really don't get the benefit until you get the report out, right? So you get all the research in. So they might be doing the research over several months, but it's not until the end in the, in the project is done that you get the benefit of that project. And that would be considered a, um, a research project. Sometimes it will come up in software development as well. Sometimes development and deployment can be separated. A lot of agencies will look at, well, you know, we're just looking at software development in different projects, different, different types of development projects, and we might decide what to deploy later. So actually the development part, they get um, a benefit from, even though they don't end up purchasing the actual software at the end. Non-severable services are bona fide needs of the fiscal year when the service began. Okay? So you have to charge the entire procurement in the fiscal year the service began. You can't order half a research report and charge it to two different years. There's no way to sever that service. So going back to the FAFSA rule on a one-year severable service contract, that crosses over fiscal years, you wouldn't need it for non severable services because you got to charge it all in the first year anyway. Doug, you look On bewildered. The Let's go back to the severable services then. You say you can use two years, two different years' money to do that with? Sure. Mm -hmm. If you structure the contract correctly. Okay. You'd have to limit the liability in the, okay. in the fiscal year. Under the normal bona fide needs rule, you would have had to do it. It's the FASA exception, the change right. in law, that allows yeah. you to charge it all in one fiscal year. So under, under normal circumstances, I would have made the first, the first period of performance up to the end of the fiscal year. Yes, yes. that's correct. That right. is correct. The old way. And I could still do that. Right. The old way was, sure. If you're, you don't have enough money to go through the right. whole fiscal year, the old way was run a contract from October 1 to September 30th. And that's why a lot of our contracts 10 years right. ago were, were that, that way. Were that way. Right. Were that right. way. Right. And a lot of times you ran out of money. When Congress changed the law in 1996, not an old rule, it's like yeah. been around for a right. long time. The military departments have had this actually since the 70s. And then, then Congress just decided, because of the exact same reason you're saying, you know, anytime you sever a contract for less than a year, your price isn't going to be as good. People are going to up the price later. It was costing the government a lot of money. So Congress came in and said, okay, no more. One year several services up to one year. You can run them cross fiscal years, fund it all in the first year of the contract. Because you have to record the entire obligation, right, of what you sign on to. So you can make it six months, you can make it all the way up to a year. Up to one year. Okay? But also, I'll give you a caveat. If you make that contract for six months starting on September when six months and March right and in March you have money left over and you would like to continue that contract you can't do it you have to live with the obligation you had in the prior year now, can you have a six month first period of performance and one year options after that's that? sure Sure, as long as it follows the contracting rules, you can do we that. We have done contracts on occasion, for example, that are test contracts right. for six months. And if it works, then we want to continue. You, you do it for a year. And then when you exercise that option, you have to have a year's worth of right. funding. Right. Um, yeah. So there are some options with severable services. Non-severable, you really don't have any options. If the service is non-severable, you have to 
obligated all up front. A lot of our um, times, though, it's not that easy to see if something is a non-servable service contract. Uh, there is a was a case at a GAO several several years ago, um, and a po po problem that I used to teach in a GAO class where it had to do with research, and there were interim reports being provided on a monthly basis. And it was actually for a congressional mandate to finish this research over a two-year period. So you were going to get a big report at the end, but the agency was going to get useful information. And in that case, it really was how you structured the contract. We could have severed off performance if we didn't have enough money for the whole thing. So the thing is, though, once you do your contract and your obligation, you have to live with what you have. You can't say, OK, well, I thought I wanted it to be severable, and now I'm going to make it non-severable. It doesn't work that way. Um, but if you're in these like very, um, probably, it can happen that you might be able to structure what you're purchasing in a severable or non-severable way. There's some things you can't. We can't pay for half a building. But well, once upon a time, I used to buy legal services for the agency for which I worked, and buy legal services to handle a case. It's one case. Mm -hmm. So you figure it's going to be non-severable. Well, depending on what kind of money we had and what our, our needs were, we said, okay, fine. It's one case, non-severable. Or, well, we'll have a contract here for the discovery period. We'll have a contra an another contract for the, or, or segment of it, for this phase of the litigation. Something that you can phase, or if you would, chunk the work. It's possible have a choice as to whether or not to declare something severable or non-severable, as she was discussed. But once you've made your election, you can't change horses in midstream. That's it. Even if downstream, it looks like, oops, I wish I'd made this other choice. It's too late. I am a little, I'm a little bit over my time. We will pick up time on Wednesday. I'm going to stick around if anybody has any questions. Um, OCB, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Also, if you have everybody have my email address. If you have specific issues you want to talk about on Wednesday, please give me an email. Shoot me an email. And CC Dora, too. And I will make sure that we get to those questions and issues. Um, even if it's not anything that we've covered, I'll try to. I know this is kind of a brief overview. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Where did I get you in here?